Put it. So today I'm going to be talking about a project I was working on this summer that we have so far titled the clinical utility of dual task testing to discriminate recurrent fallers from single and or non fallers in elder populations. So I worked alongside this with various other um, people, including student Dr. Lowinger, student Dr. Motts, Dr. Abu, and student Dr. Peters. Okay, so I was introduced very nicely. Thank you so much for the introduction, but I will just reiterate some things. So I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Redlands in 2019. There I was working on mostly biochemistry research on yeast products. And then in my gap years, I was at UCLA in the orthopedic surgery department. Here, I mostly focus on working with our infectious joint disease doctors in post arthroplastic patients, as well as in spine surgery outcomes. And then currently I am in my second year at KCU. So the first thing I want to talk about is the clinical implications of recurrent falls. So we have seen um, <clears throat> with a few studies that there is a positive association with hospitalizations when there are recurrent falls occurring with these patients. So within these patients in the hospital database, we can see that there are a larger amount of physical and psychological deficits in these patients who are falling more frequently. And this is not seen um, in those of ones that are only falling say once per year or ones that are not falling at all in the past year. We've also seen in a study by Formiga that significant amount of patients who had had hip fractures had a history of recurrent falls. Within their um, patients they were looking at with their hip fractures, 22 of their patient population had had recurrent falls versus that of non-recurrent falls. Now that we're talking about that, let's focus on our older patient populations. So we know just from sort of as we age and progress that falls are often an implication or combination of factors that being personal. So whether we're losing balance or just losing mobility and then environmental factors as well. So in this photo here, I've attached there is an elderly gentleman who was trying to ambulate upstairs. And given there was a change in um, coordination as well as a new uh, environment, say the stairs, he and inadvertently fell. So when we, when we think about falling <clears throat> in our older patients, we have to think about what is causing this to happen. What are the risk factors? So we often associate falling with an increase in age as well a lot as well as a loss in strength and balance. And one thing in particular that I'm looking at in our study is the lack of ability to divide attention. So you can think that okay, so as we age, we're walking, perhaps, and now we can. In our younger years, we can walk and do something else and have it not be an issue. But as we gain age and lose our attention to be able to do these things, we're walking and then maybe say like on our phone or thinking about something else, and that would potentially lead for us to fall more. So in another study by Barry and Miller, they found that 30% of falls would require medical attention, having to go to the hospital for some variety of factors, and about 10% of falls cause a fracture, most notably a hip fracture. So speaking a bit more on divided attention and dual tasking. So dual task is an assessment they can use in clinic and other laboratory settings where you can evaluate motor and cognitive um, ability to combine those things. So within this photo here, you can see a patient or the person being studied is walking and then being told to do a variety or some sort of cognitive task. So they could be asked to walk 20 meters and then say count backwards from 100 by sevens. So as you're doing this, you're evaluating various factors that can contribute to your gait. So how long it takes to start the, gut, start the gait, how long it takes to complete your 20 meters, 50 meters, whatever they prescribe, as well as errors in cognition. Um, so if you're able to complete your task without uh, any errors of sorts. We can see that by doing this, you can sort of look at all, all sorts of factors. So whether that be the literal gait initiation or just like walking, how if you have a various amount of lateralization when you're walking, so there's lack of balance. There's a ton of things you can look at within the study. Um, and then when looking at dual task itself, studies have shown that dual task can predict future falls. This was, this was specifically seen in a study by Moore and Hunter. So they found that there was a change in gait from baseline when they were using dual task as opposed to just being asked to walk. So these changes in gaits were associated with future fall risk. Um, by using that study as sort of a basis for my current study, we found that um, we hope that our study will be the first to systematically assess recurrent and or in bold future fallers from single fallers. 
Um, I hope that this will be a contribution, a good contribution to healthcare as it can kind of provide a sense of knowing when patients are at higher risk of falling um, as well as associated healthcare costs. So I, when I think about this type of stuff uh, with my previous experience at UCLA where I saw a lot of hip arthroplasties, uh, it's really important to know when patients are going to fall or when they might be indicated for a future surgery if they were to fall. And if we can prevent that, we can obviously prevent uh, Medicare costs and reduce just uh, comorbidities as well. And then the general purpose of my study was to identify if dual tasks could be utilized in a clinical setting to detect if patients are at a higher risk for recurrent falls. So again, I hope that the results that we find can help provide for the knowledge of future fall prevention. And with future studies, we hope to um, benefit to provide sort of review to guide a design to see when patients are at future fall risk and then to create a better assessment of dual tasks for that purpose in laboratory and clinical settings. Um, and then as a preface, since we are just working on this, we have sort of have the baseline and background. Um, our current work is just a protocol and we hope to create a future framework based on what we have thus far. Now, speaking on our methodology, we chose to pursue the study using a systematic review. And this was using the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis um, with acronym PRISMA. So I was able to uh, register our protocol onto a database of systematic reviews called Prospero under our register ID you can see on the screen. Um, our database search was started in June of 2024. So this past summer is when we all started to take this information down. And then we are currently um, waiting to progress to look at our research. So as I mentioned, we were looking at recurrent fallers in older populations. So how do we create a search term that is able to create a big umbrella to find all these things? So on the page here, you can see I have notated some things we were looking for and words that we were able to sort of branch that out to have a wider range of uh, articles fall into our database. So for a dual task, words like motor cognitive, divided attention, executive function were used. For age populations, anything, we chose 60 plus. Um, this would include things like senior, senior citizens and elderly patients. For recurrent falls, this was difficult because recurrent falls is the same thing as just falls or falling. So things like multiple falls we looked for, but was one of the things we had to really phase out when we were looking at studies. And then we also had to think about study inclusion types. For this particular study, we chose to do a great variety. So we chose like retrospective and prospective studies. Um, the main thing we excluded was protocols. So you can see here, this is an example of one of my um, database searches I pushed for, I believe, PubMed. So I, it's all sort of a word blob, but you can see that I've bolded some of the words that we chose that were maybe not associated, but had similar descriptives like divided attention, aged, and recurrent falls or multiple falls. So as I said, we pushed these, uh, this word bank through all of these databases, and this is the number of criteria that came out or number of articles that came out when we pushed the criteria. Um, so you can see there's a lot. <laughs> uh, we had a total of 1,708 articles that were initially uh, found when searching these terms. Now that we had all these articles, we really had to tune down what and what we did not want in our articles and what we were looking for in order to find our results that we were seeking. So we had two reviewers searching and the eligibility of these articles, and they were looking for inclusion and exclusion criteria, including adults who are 60 plus with recurrent fall data, community dwelling individuals, so that included people who are out and about in the daily life, um, not ones who are permanently hospitalized or in retirement homes for long term care. And then we also obviously use studies that do utilize dual task as a means of evaluating the patients. For our exclusion criteria, we included patients who had a history of neurological disorders, including anything between um, Parkinson's, remarkable sclerosis, strokes, et cetera. We chose to exclude these because we wanted a patient um, uh, for evaluation at baselines and not ones that had neurological disorders that could increase or predispose them to an increased number of falls. Okay, so how did we screen these articles? With the uh, big mess of 1,708 articles, um, I was 
I needed a guidance as to sort of how to do this. So my team uses a program called Zotero, which is a place where it essentially combines all the articles you have and pushes them out with things like their title, the author, um, and other uh, basic information about them. So with our 1,708, the first thing we want to do is delete any duplicates. So as you can imagine, when you're pushing articles through a database and you have key terms, it's going to have duplicates that happen to come up and through its search criteria, as well as duplicates amongst our uh, various search engines that we use. So just by deleting the duplicates itself, we got rid of 671 articles. So now we're down to approximately 1,000. And with the rest of 1,000, now we have to do an initial screening. And what that entails is me and Alexa separately looking at the titles as well as the abstracts of these articles in question and seeing if they fit into our criteria just based on those things. For me personally, this led to 53 articles in total. So this Alexa, I believe had around hundred. So from that, we then had to go into a secondary screening where we had to narrow it down further. So we have this many articles, how do we do that further? So what we did at that point is we opened up the full, um, full article with the full text and read the article and saw, and sought out if it fell into sorry sought out sought out if it fell into our inclusion next year, exclusion criteria. For this combined with me and Alexa doing it separately, now we had a total of nineteen that we needed to utilize a third reviewer to a third reviewer to find the discrepancies between our decisions and come to a conclusion on which ones truly fit our criteria. And this led to a total of fourteen articles. So just to give you a little bit of um, visual aspect to how this all works. These numbers are all ones that I've described previously, but we had the 1708, um, which we found on the databases. We, we screened these, um, which with initial uh, deletion of the duplicates led to about a thousand. We then did a primary screening and then a secondary screening, which eventually led to our 14 final, which is what we currently have. So now that we have this, Looking forward, what do we do with the um, articles we have acquired? So the next thing we have to do to analyze these and to talk about it in the future, and again, this is something that is pending on my end and in the future for future work, we need to extract the information that we need to discuss this and to figure out what results we have. So what are we looking for? We are looking for the study populations and the characteristics. So as of any study that's looking at a great variety of people, they want to see um, common factors such as uh, sex, as well as potential like comorbidities and other various factors. Um, and then the main things we're looking for in our, our data is fall outcomes. So us in particular, we're going to be looking at things like how many recurrent followers are there, um, what described this for this article, what, how many of them are single followers, how many of them had not fallen. And then lastly, we're looking at method methodolo methodology of interest. So how are these studies fall tracking this? Are they looking at it retrospectively, prospectively, and how are they doing so? Um, various methods could include mailing them pamphlets every month, asking them to fill out a tracker, or calling them every month, or even calling them and asking them how many falls they've had in the past. So a various way means of ways of doing that. And the same with dual task. How exactly are these articles looking at dual tasking and by what means? So are they asking them to walk? Are they asking them to motion for something? Are they asking them to count backwards? Are they asking them to compute mathematically? How are they doing the dual task? And lastly, of course, we're looking at the results. So what did the articles find? Um, specifically, is there a correlation between dual tasks and recurrent falls? Lastly, um, before we get into writing, we're going to have to assess bias. So with every article, there is um, inherently means of bias that comes when it's being written. So we have, in order to assess this, we will be doing a standard quality assessment. Um, and as you can see in this photo I've attached, there are 14 main questions that are being assessed when looking at these articles. Things like, um, is there a good question involved? Is the methodology intact? Is the analysis, statistical analysis appropriate? Um, so we grade these on a scale of zero to two, with two being complete, one being partial, and zero being none. And we'll do this for every single one of the 14 articles we have. Um, with that being said, based on what we have seen so far and what I read, I believe there is strong methodological quality. Um, this is pending analysis that I mentioned from both Alexa's and the third party. Um, and then we're also pending full analysis and data extraction for all of our results. With that being said, uh, with a good general idea of what we have so far, we do have some projected ideas of what may to come. 
So uh, I project to observe a direct relationship between poor dual task scores and recurrent falls of older populations. And this is based on Maura Hunter's study. And then we also project, as I said, that the studies will be of strong quality according to standard quality assessment. Lastly, I quickly just want to speak about some limitations. It's always good to sort of check yourself and see where you're at with according to the study and what can be assessed and evaluated further. So our greatest limitation, I believe, is the inclusion of retrospective studies. Um, there has been some debate over whether or not retrospectively analyzing or questioning someone's fall, falls, previous falls are um, accurate, and this is because of recall bias. So you can imagine when asked to recall information that you might be um, incorrect just because of recall bias, just because you may forget, things like that. Whereas and if you ask forward and say, um, send someone a mail pamphlet and say how many times you've fallen the past month and been asked to report that day by day, that'd be less likely to have recall bias. And then another limitation is that our studies we found were only in English. This is due to us pushing a search criteria that used English words. Um, and then also these studies, there are, we, I happened to find a study, for example, that was in Portuguese that had a Portuguese abstract translation, but not a full text article in Portuguese. So that obviously uh, excluded me from being able to gather that data because I could not read it. Um, so we don't have any articles, unfortunately, that would not be in English. And that is the conclusion of my presentation thus far. We are still working on it and I'm excited to work on it some more, but please let me know if there's any questions.